my name is Ali Kujuri, those of you do not know me, and I'm from the uh, engineering uh, science uh, department, uh, one of the and one of the organizers of this lecture series. On behalf of our department and the uh, School of Science and Technology, I would like to thank you all for uh, joining this uh, uh, 11th lecture in the academic year and 134th lecture uh, in the series since we started in 2006. I would like also to thank uh, our uh, speaker who, in fact, uh, uh, accepted our talk for today. The other organizers of this uh, lecture series are, in fact, Mr. Sharon Marivani and also Ms. Uh, Kate, uh, Kate Lapp. Uh, before I uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, uh, we have the uh, next uh, talk uh, will be on uh, April the 19th. And the title of the talk is, Why did Silicon Valley develop in San Francisco Bay Area instead of the East Coast? And I think that's going to be very interesting for you. You can get some history and so forth and why it is. That's, that's going to be by Dr. Uh, Don Strack, uh, who is an adjunct professor in the department. Uh, at uh, 5.30, uh, we are going to have, I mean, the, the pizza is, is going to arrive, and I hope you uh, all enjoy having it. Our guest speaker for today is Mr. Uh, Sergio Canavati, and the title of his talk is Engineering Knowledge, Industry Experience, and Recognition of Opportunities for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Dr. Sergio Canavati is an assistant professor of management at Sonoma State University. His uh, research focuses on entrepreneurship opportunity recognition, family firms, and entrepreneurship uh, leadership. Sergio also collaborates with North Coast SCORE. The SCORE stands for Schools of California Online Resources for education, Educators uh, to, to advise a small, medium family businesses in, uh, in region. Sergio holds PhD in economics and entrepreneurship and innovation from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. So here is Sergio. Then. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you so much for having me. For me, it's really cool to present to an audience that I am uh, that is not in, in my field, from another field, I consider that to be the most interesting thing to do because I always speak to people in my field and it makes it more difficult to get more variety of ideas and more creative ideas and also to see what people outside the field think because um, you guys are, from a field that is supposed to be distant, but it actually is really related to entrepreneurship, and that's what I hope to, to talk about. So today I'm going to talk about a work in progress that I've been working on for the past three years, and I felt it was really relevant for um, this colloquium because it relates to different types of knowledge and how that helps identify opportunities for creating a new venture for entrepreneurship. Um, so with that, before I start, I wanted to um, thank the people that have helped me connect with the engineering department, uh, Chris Stewart, Ali Kujuri, who helped set up this talk for me, and Professor Faramond, who has worked to create avenues for me to be engaged with your department, and I'm really thankful for that, for the opportunity to um, contribute or collaborate with people that do work that is so serious as yourselves. And in the senior design, by the way, you can tell it. In the and exactly. Design. So the one, when I said work that is so serious, I meant really rigorous and um, really thorough work that I haven't seen in, in, in many other of my experiences, work that is complete and 
everyone in the senior design projects takes the, the uh, coursework with the utmost seriousness and that is something that really impresses me and also motivates me to, to be a, a, you know, to be a better instructor and also to do a better job myself. So with that, I will um, get into the topic of today, which is how do people use the, what they know to find opportunities to create a new business or to use a technology to make money. Um, so I wanted to start by defining what an opportunity is. And an opportunity is simply when you come to the realization that something that you can do will create in the future um, something that, that is feasible and desirable for yourself that you can enact it and that can add value in the market. Value for yourself and value for consumers. That's why sales are called um, output um, that involves value added. So the thing about the opportunity is that the opportunity has to do with something that allows you to make money in the environment, a change a new technology, a new development, but the technology itself doesn't represent an opportunity if you don't see it as an opportunity and you don't feel that you can exploit it as an opportunity. So in that sense, an opportunity has both something outside that creates a, a way to make money and something related to the person that allows that person to see that as an opportunity, right? Because that's the question. Why do some people recognize opportunities and others don't? And one of the reasons um, would be that they know something that other people don't know. That maybe they have experience working with that technology. They have technical knowledge. Um, and that's why they're able to say, oh, I know this technical, you know, I know this technology now, we have this problem that emerged. Maybe that technology can be used to solve that problem, and we can create a business to make money with it. So that's the core essence of what I am arguing, the, the role of what you, the prior knowledge in recognizing opportunities. So what, I, what we have done is divided the opportunity recognition process into two stages. In the first stage, people come up with an opportunity idea. They have an idea, and, and I will define it, but they, they have an idea of something they could do to make money. And in the elaboration stage, they work to develop confidence in whether the opportunity is feasible, is desirable, and it actually is a match for the problem. I mean, it's a match for the technology or the, whatever they know, whatever solution they have, right? So the outcome, if, they were, if they're able to develop confidence that it's a good opportunity, should be that they decide to launch a venture. But as I will show in a minute, that depends on whether they believe there's an opportunity there for somebody else or an opportunity for me, right? Um, maybe some of you have identified an opportunity and said, you know, somebody could make a lot of money doing this. But you have never said, or, or, but in that situation, maybe you didn't say, I could make a lot of money doing this. Do you see the difference between that? Is there an opportunity? Yes, okay. So is, is that opportunity for me? Is this something I can do? Or is it an opportunity for someone else who has the uh, knowledge, the, the, who has the access to the resources and has the experience, right? So that's, and if they realize that there's an opportunity for, for them, then they may decide to enact that opportunity or that idea. So let me 
break down everything that I just said into more um, detailed slides. So the opportunity idea, the person arrives at an idea through a combination of something in, in the environment that changes, that creates an opportunity. But that, enough is, that in itself is not enough for the person to identify an idea, right? Because something can happen in the environment, and one person doesn't see an opportunity or an idea, and the other person does, right? So there's also personal attributes of the individual that enable him or her to consider that um, an idea for an opportunity. Like, for example, things like global warming, right, creates fires. Now you're faced with fires, right? That's a change in the environment. That creates a need. So if you find a technology or you know about something, you have some knowledge of chemistry, for example, and then you know something that can be used in, in that situation to solve the problem, then you might, you might have an idea, right? But you still don't know how you would go about, have you ever had an idea, but you, have, you don't feel like you can enact it? Like you would, there you go. OK, so that's the difference between an idea and then the process of developing the confidence in that, that it's a good idea and that, that it can be enacted. So the recognition, the identification of an opportunity idea happens in the creative stage. And it happens when the individual perceives an opportunity and Whether it's an opportunity for making money or not, the person doesn't know. They just have an idea. What if I did this? But they have an incomplete model of what it represents. And I will, I will explain that in more detail. But the creative stage and the recognition of an opportunity idea is a prerequisite for the elaboration stage. It happens after you have an idea, you've been thinking about it for a while, and then you seek meaning about that idea through interaction with peers. And there are several layers of social interaction, but the most relevant one happens with your peers. Then there are like your instructors, and there, there are maybe uh, people that you vaguely know, then there are experts. Right, but the people that influence the formation of your beliefs about whether it's an idea that you need to pursue or someone else could pursue happens within your inner circle. So this is a process, and in the end, you either form beliefs that it's a good idea or that it's not a good idea. Now, this is the, the, the model, a basic representation of what the model of an opportunity could look like, right? What a good opportunity could look like for an individual would be an opportunity with a clearly defined customer segment, right? There is a group of people that can buy it. There's a group of people for whom this would be useful, right? Which is the customer need the value part. Like, there's a need, right? Like I mentioned, for example, the global warming creates more frequent fires, which creates a need to solve that problem. Right, so we have a need, we have a problem. And do we have a customer segment? Do we have a group of people that would be willing to pay for a solution? Who are they, right? Do we know? Once we, solve, we, we talk to people, once we talk to our dad, who's an expert maybe on something related, our uncle, right, our peers, our inner cir circle, our friends, then we start to form beliefs about each one of these three components of the model. Is there a, a segment that wants to pay for it, right? Um, is there a problem? And how well does this 
solutions solve that problem? And finally, can I get the resources to start it? Can I get the funding? Can I get access to the technology? Can I, have, can I get the, the, te the technicians or the, the lab personnel that I need? The cash? And do I have the knowledge to do it? Right? Do I know how to manage the situation? Do I have the capabilities? And that's the opportunity confidence component. Now, check this out. If the individual forms a positive belief about the fact that there is a group of people that have the money to pay for this in innovation, to solve that, and the, the, the innovation solves a genuine problem or need, but he or she doesn't feel like she has access to the resources needed to launch this or to develop this technology and doesn't have the capabilities to do so, then that person now is sure that there is a good opportunity there for someone else. That doesn't lead to technology commercialization. That doesn't lead to a new venture. Now, just like in the previous example, if that person forms positive beliefs about the existence of a segment of people that are, have the money and are willing to pay for it, and that the invention addresses a significant need or a problem that is pressing, and that person feels like they can get access to the resources that they need to launch this venture or to develop this technology, um, for example, to get a med, um, medicine approved by the FDA, a drug, how many years does it take? Several years. And what do they require you to do in order to apply? You have to test. And millions and maybe billion, you know, billions of dollars worth of testing, engineers, and whatnot. So, but if that individual feels like they can get the access to, to the resources and they have the capabilities to do it, they can do it, they can manage the company, they can manage, manage the project, um, then they have formed a first person opportunity confidence. They have formed beliefs that the opportunity is feasible, it's desirable, and it's a fit for the problem, right? It says the solution is a fit for the problem, and that's what leads to people actually continuing working on their innovation. So when people are making an assessment of whether there's an opportunity for them, they are focusing on themselves, right? Can I get access to those resources? Can I handle this situation? Do I have the capabilities to do this? So what role does what you already know play in this process? Remember, there are two stages, right? So when we are talking about a problem, right, a, we're talking about an innovation, there has to be a match in between the two, right? The innovation has to be a solution for the problem. Does that make sense? And whatever you're developing has to be a match for what these people want. Whoever approves the purchases of um, fire retardants, um, whoever has the money, how much money they have to pay for it, is it going to be so expensive that they can't pay for it, right? So you have to match what you see with the, the problem, right? So in order to do that, people rely on 
mental models like the one I showed you, which is why I showed you the model, so that now when I talk about cognition, I don't lose you. Because you can make reference back to what, I, what you just learned. That's exactly the role of prior knowledge. I just gave you a new category of mental models. What a mental model is. So it's all about identifying similarities between what your technology can do and what needs, what problem someone else in some other country has. And in order to make these connections, people rely on structural alignment. So here's what happens. When I showed you the concept of a mental model, most I, I have never heard of a mental model, and most people may not have heard of it, right? So when you are faced with a new stimuli, something, you make sense of it by saying, does it look like something that I have seen before? Like, if you look at this chair, you know it's a chair. Why? Because it has somewhere to sit. It also has something um, to um, recline on or something to support your back. It has legs, so that's a chair, right? We, then we can talk about that's a black chair, that's a plastic plus metal chair. That looks like a somewhat comfortable chair, but it doesn't have the, so now you can compare it to other chairs that you have seen in the past, right? That's what people do when they see something new. When you come up on, um, you learn something in the classroom, Right? That's a new stimuli. And then it reminds you of some problem that they have somewhere in Idaho. And whatever this thing that you just learned may just be the solution to that problem. That is the structural alignment. You are making associations between what you are just being faced with with what you know. Does that make sense? How can you make those associations if you don't know? Any, if you've lived in, in your mom's basement and never did, you know, went to school or anything like that, right? So that's why prior knowledge is important in the process of the structural alignment. So if you have been exposed to a problem, like for me, this is the first time that I lived through a wildfire. So now that I've been exposed to this, um, or this is the first time that a wildfire has been uh, impacted my life so closely, right? I used to think of it as things that happen, you know, I don't know, like very rarely, and they don't really affect people. I had never actually thought of it, right? But now that I'm exposed to that problem, now I'm more aware when I see something that may be a solution to it. Does that make sense? So it allows the, the formation of associations or connections between what you learn and how it can be used to solve that problem. For example, in a lab, when you learn something about a technology, what a technology can do, and you know about a, a problem that some other people have, then you can make that association, right? What you have come up with is simply an idea, a very incomplete mental model of what eventually may look like a technology that is commercialized for money. So, when you make those connections between what you were just faced with, with what you just learned, and something that you already knew. There are two types of connections that you can make. You can make connections between superficial features. Like, OK, um, this chair is black, like the chair I have at home, for example, right? You're making a connection between two superficial features. Um, 
this chair is made of plastic, right? Now, the structural relationships would be something like this chair has armrests that support my body, my arms, and it makes me feel more comfortable. Or I would say this chair doesn't. So it's a relationship between two things, right? My arm and the chair. Or in the case of a technology, um, for example, what does the technology produce? It produces um, 3D objects, right? That's saying, oh, that machine produces 3D objects like this machine, right? That's a superficial feature. And you're making a comparison based on a superficial feature. Now, to make a comparison based on structural relationships would be that machine makes 3D objects using the same technology that the other machine does, right? It's a relationship between two superficial features. Or saying um, the, the chain, move in, in both cases, the chain moves the device that prints, right? So we're not just talking about one thing, but the relationships between um, the objects. Or if we look at higher order structural relationships, we would say the, this product uses the same chain mechanism to move the device that prints, and that, and that allows it to make um, 3D objects using less um, resources or less material, and therefore are cheaper. So, the, the key takeaway from that is you want to get to a point where you are able to make associations based on structural relationships, not simply superficial features. Because making associations based on superficial features leads to more creativity, no doubt. You, you, um, leads to ideas. But in order for you to get to the conviction that you want to do something, you have to make um, relationships based. You have to make associations between problem and solution, you know, discovery, so technology, device that you learn to use, and solution based on structural rela uh, relationships. Like how the relationships between the objects lead to a different outcome that is superior something that could have value in the market. And in order to do that, it usually takes expertise. It takes not only uh, education, but also train, practical training. Because experts tend to rely a lot more on structural relationships than um, novice users, novice, novice. Um, newbie users. Um, so, and when we make associations between things, in this case problem solution, based on structural relationships, we feel more confident about them. We feel like it's something um, that can be explained by, me by a mechanism of cause and effect. And we feel more comfortable with that than something that can be explained by superficial features. And that's why it's important, because it leads to action. Oh, OK. OK, so my next slide is close to, how much time do I have? Well, it's another, let's say, half an hour. Half an hour? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so th this slide touches upon the second component of the study, which is the different types of prior knowledge. Um, so. 
And we, now we want to apply that to the different stages of opportunity recognition. We have technical experience and expertise. We have entrepreneurship experience. And then we have education, going to school. Now, in the process of, rec of, of making associations between things, when you have been trained to look at things one way, when you have received education, you can become so absorbed into that framework that you learned that you tend to explain everything in terms of that framework. Has it ever happened to you that you used to think in many different ways, and once they taught you to think about things in one theory, in one way, now that's how you explain the world. And it's very difficult to explain the world in any other, within any other framework. That happened to me as I studied economics. I became so used to the terms that they use, the way that they look at relationships, that anybody that talked about the situation without using these terms and referring to these models, I couldn't understand. I couldn't even think that there was much value to what they were saying. And yet that was me two years ago, right? So it limits what we see as an opportunity. Because we have been indoctrinated, to, to put it in a more um, common term. So, experience should lead to making associations based on structural relationships and higher order structural relationships, like relationships between the superficial features that lead to outcomes, like a lighter product, a more mechanized production process, right? And that can be associated to more lower costs and whatnot, right? And if we are to apply um, the structural um, relationship theory to entrepreneurship, it would be um, these features that we would pay attention to because we know that the process of deciding whether it's a good idea for yourself is very stressful. Think about what's you know, on the line. What are you risking? Can you provide examples of why you would feel stressed when making a decision whether to start a company or not? Whether that idea is worth pursuing. Do you, do you have any examples? You have to mortgage your house to get the money. So getting access to the, getting the resources together bring, you know, brings a lot of anxiety because of the risk involved, right? You're risking your personal property or your livelihood in order to pursue this idea. So it has, yes. Right, so there's also the hassle of asking people for money, fundraising, and then how you, you have to take the risk that you may never be able to pay back the loan. And that would, what would be the consequences of that? Debt, not being able to borrow in the future, right? So it's an emotionally demanding task, cognitively demanding, and it, <coughs> involves a lot of uncertainty. And that's why it's important. Also leads to a lot of divorces. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, it has, if, if you start, uh, yeah, if you decide to launch, the, I had never thought of that. If you decide to launch the venture, you're committing to basically doing that, eight, you know, 80 hours a week, right? So. You, it takes away time from your family and from whatever you want to do. Definitely, yeah. 
that brings, you know, fear, uncertainty. So it's not an easy decision to make when you are making these types of, um, forming these beliefs, making assessment about, assessments about um, the different components of the model. So what I, what I have been working on is a meta-analysis and basically, we summarized uh, the results of 132 different studies. We didn't look at studies that had the same group of people, right? They had to be different people in different time periods, et cetera. And that leads to observations on, I, I, it would be wrong to say 386,000 individuals, 83,000 individuals, because sometimes it's for several years but it's simply um, individual year observations. But it's probably close to maybe, um, could be 100,000 people, 100,000 cognitive processes examined. Um, and that this is a, a synthesis tool that allows us to derive um, statistical summaries of all the results rather than one study. So I, I brought some, I, I, I put two tables in the study because this is a work in progress. This table that I'm gonna show you next shows you all my, my new studies, my, my work in progress. The table after that is, is a table that has fewer studies, but it, it was done in a more rigorous way because I, I did it and I completed that process. I'm still in the process of uh, refining the data in this table. But what you see here are correlation coefficients. What that means is when education goes up, how does the ability to, to, to recognize these opportunities go up, right? Does that, do you, is the concept of a correlation coefficient common in engineering? Like, give me one example of how it is applied. Or just a correlation, um, the concept of correlation in engineering. note association between two things. So this is the association between, for example. So what I wanted to show you was this. Remember we talked about the, uh, the ideas, right? So what is the impact of the different types of knowledge um, on the ability to generate ideas for, for entrepreneurship or commercializing technology, inventions in the lab? Um, and what you see is that in this case, for example, when the individuals, um, when the individuals lack the entrepreneurship experience, then they tend to form third person opportunity confidence, right? They believe it's an awesome opportunity for someone else to pursue. And otherwise, um, they're more likely to form, or the association is, is stronger when they have experience in entrepreneurship. Now let me show you um, these other results that I wanted to complement my presentation with to show that um, in some cases, for the formation of ideas, for stumbling upon something and saying, oh, this, is, this could be an idea for making money, Right? Um, it is very important to have in, in, technical knowledge, technical expertise. So what that means is if you have a student that has never seriously tried to learn anything outside of their field, in my field being business, right? They only know about business. It's going to be more difficult for them to identify ideas for, entrepreneur, uh, for innovation, for entrepreneurship, because they simply don't 
have um, the knowledge about other things that exist. Um, how to use different devices, how different technologies work. Like what is covered in the lab when people become acquainted with technical processes, devices, um, with things that we take for granted that we don't have no idea how they work. Does that make sense? So it, the takeaway in my opinion is getting knowledge in areas other than your area and being an expert in technical issues is key for, an for a business student, for an entrepreneurship student to be able to see opportunities that they may never see otherwise because they have no idea of the, techn of the inner workings of a device, um, of how to use a CAD software. Um, or if we were to extend it, even traveling to other countries, right? Doing things that increase your knowledge helps you be more creative and see ideas for implementing maybe something they do in another country and doing it here and, and making money, right? Because this is the creative stage. But in order for entrepreneurs to develop, belie I mean, engineers to develop beliefs that they can commercialize the technology, that is something they can do either alone or, as a, or with a team, they need to gain experience in doing something in entrepreneurship. And here in entrepreneurship, I also included entrepreneurship courses, um, entrepreneurship training, because it tends to be experiential and based on doing interviews with students or developing a logo, trying to develop a website and testing the market, right? So basically, just like business students, seriously need to understand how technology works in order to be able to identify opportunities they may otherwise miss. In order for all groups of students, they, they also need to have entrepreneurship experience, whether it's a, an experiential experience guided by the instructor or actually trying to set up a venture. Here's something about structural alignment. When you fail, you keep thinking about that failure for a long time. So the next time that you see a problem, you, will, you may try to take away from what you learned from your failure to say this is a good opportunity because the other one failed because it didn't have the money quickly. So we were waiting three years for the people to buy us. But these people will, will pay within a month, right? So go out, I mean, experience is key. And there is no way going to school and, hey, I, I work. My, my job depends on people going to school. But still, going to school is not going to be enough. You have to get um, entrepreneurship experience. You have to get ex uh, professional experience. You have to learn how things work. Because here under industry and professional experience, I included technical expertise, knowledge of the technology, knowledge of, of ways to use the technology, um, in engineering knowledge, engineering experience. So for students, what that means is they need to prioritize also internships, collaboration with industry, and being um, experts in one area is not going to be en enough. They actually need to understand that not only do they have to pursue their main 
field of study, but they also have to get, if they're business students, they have to get understanding that goes beyond a textbook of how things work. So with that, I bring my presentation to an end. person opportunity confidence needs to be seen higher than the third person so that you would succeed, right? Is it the idea? Yeah. Um, first person opportunity confidence is what leads to people actually commercializing uh, technology. Um, do you, I don't have the, fight, the facts completely uh, the whole story, but I know Bill Gates didn't create the program that made him a millionaire. A billionaire, right? Yes. He didn't. Yeah. Well, so how did he get it? So the story is like some some other person developed it. I don't remember his name. And uh, he spent, he, at that time, he was selling his software to many people. He went to IBM also, this Windows small dash program. So this IBM said this is a nonsense program. He said no. But then somehow Bill Gates came to know about this person and then this program, what it, he was developing. Then he went and he bought it for some X money. And then he took it and then he take it to that. It, it was then to such a big level, he developed it. And then it became better. That right. So he took an, an idea, someone else's concept, and he thought that was an opportunity for himself. Because what happened is they went to Seattle to buy it from the other company, but the owner wasn't there. And the employees didn't want to negotiate in, on behalf of the owner. So the IBM representatives, they went to um, see Bill Gates, and he told them, yes, I have something to sell you. you know. And then he went, bought that program for $50,000 and sold it to IBM. So in order for people to develop the belief that they can enact an opportunity, they need to have experience, right? He had experience founding his company. He had experience in, in the industry, no doubt. He had developed his own software and had failed, right? So even if you fail, learning is always happening. And you're becoming more skilled at identifying what a good technology looks like, what a good commercialization opportunity looks like. And in fact, the uh, confidence, it seems, is, is, is plays a big role. Yes. Yeah. Confidence in the, in the opportunity. Yes. I see that uh, first person confidence, which seems to me the most important, that has the highest number there related to having experience in entrepreneurship rather than uh, what you learn in class, for instance. But like they say, um, correlation is not causation. Definitely. How do you know that it's not just the personality of those people rather than the knowledge they have? Some, you know, some other factor. Uh, yeah, so the, there could be many confounding factors. It could be that entrepreneurs are, I mean, people with these characteristics are attracted to entrepreneurship, but what I do know is the studies that I'm including in the, in the, in the meta-analysis, um, they have looked at the um, cognitive processes, the structural alignment process of entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs, and they've found that they are different, that entrepreneurs tend to um, rely more on higher level structural relationships. And that may explain why they are able to develop confidence. Um, and they also have the experience in launching a company. So remember that the third component had to do with like, do you have the capabilities to do it? Um, so it is very, this is not causation. I am in, in that's a very good point. Meta-analysis does not, cannot prove causation. It, it can only prove correlation, association between two things, 
and it's never clear what causes what. But um, because we, I explained like conceptually how we believe things are associated, right? What is associated with, with, with what and for what reasons. But the takeaway simply is don't, don't be afraid of gaining experience in something other than your field because there is a learning process involved and as, as you gain, as you become an expert, you start to be more proficient in the way that you think. Yeah. In the third row, we noticed that the, the first person confidence is not as high as the third. So this means that maybe that third person, because he has the first two uh, confidences, he can go and buy the other confidence using other people in the third party to get a, uh, that is the industry and professional experience. Is it true? Um, See now the, the, the they may thing. actually sell it. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. They may actually, and, and that is a, something that is available to, to you guys to like open innovation, right? They may not be able to take it all the way, but they may be, this is an opportunity, a great opportunity for another company. That I had never thought of, and it's actually a very, pro, has profound implications, right? Because if you like the entrepreneurship experience, it's still good to be able to be proficient at the evaluation of opportunities because you can sell them out to other companies. Yes. On, on his comment, I'm wondering if because you have more experience, you know it's harder than the person who doesn't. So forming beliefs about the opportunity that are positive may not be necessarily a good thing, right? Because you mortgage your home. I mean, you, uh, you use cash out your home mortgage and use it to launch a company that's going to fail, you know. So forming confidence beliefs about a, an opportunity that is not good is not a good thing. And that's a limitation of the study um, that I recently became aware of, right? It's not just forming confidence beliefs. Are, is that a good thing in the first place, right? Now, uh, from your experience, well, you know, we noticed that there are a bunch of factors that uh, you need to meet and then own to make the, the thing happen, right? Now, question is that which one of these factors you can buy and then make the opportunity, you know? Right. Right. So you don't actually, there doesn't necessarily have to be an opportunity for you, and you can actually. Yeah, you can actually hire someone to do it, um, but that person would have to be proficient in the technical aspect too in order to make that matching, right? But you could, like, how does it work in team in teams, right? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, that's a good you question. You can see that people can go and hire hire lawyers, they can go and hire engineers, they can go. So there are a bunch of things that you can buy, right, and to make the opportunity happen and succeed. Definitely, and that yeah, that would require access to those resources. But yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks for being patient. Thank you. Thank you.